Hey guys, so welcome to Economics 2 KO3. My name is Radic. I am your TA for the class. So what are we doing here? These are going to be your online reviews. I understand a lot of you are busy people. I'm a busy person and you want to be able to see this review at any point in time with your own convenience. And you can pause it, you can rewind it, and you can take notes. Now, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to quickly talk about the Staples Act right now, or not the Staples Act, but what's, what, what a staple is and why it is significant for this course. And I am going to go through what I thought were the key points in chronological order. Now, you should be familiar with what the material is up to this point, and this chronological order should be of no surprise to you. It is all the material that has been covered in class, and it is only in chronological order because it made more sense to me in chronological order. If this doesn't make sense to you in chronological order, well, take notes and uh, then arrange it according to topic. So first of all, we're going to talk about what a staple is. Uh, a staple is a commodity that is a very unprocessed at the point of export. So in the scope of this class, we have the five Fs. And the five Fs are our staples. Um, it is fishing, farming, forestry, fur, and fuel. Farming leads to settlement, then to urban development, development derived from the staple, and that is growth from the staple. Um, staples create linkages. We have backward, forward, and final demand linkages. Now, quickly reviewing what they are, a backward linkage um, is the building of the infrastructure to help extract the staple, so rail, road, not railroad, but rail and road, and canals. Forward linkages, um, the staple is processed to some degree before being exported. So say a sawmill for lumber, or say wheat being turned into flour um, through a wheat mill. Now we have final demand linkages, which is the local demand for a finished good. Wood stays local and is manufactured into a finished product. Now keep in mind the very important thing about staples is it's not all good. The problem with staples is overconcentration leads to a staples trap. And what the staples trap basically is, is the economy is too focused on exporting that one staple and it bases its entire economy on that one staple. And then if the, the tastes, the world tastes change and that staple is no longer in demand from that country, then the economy will collapse. So as I promised, we are going to go in chronological order, so let's start at the 1400s. In the 1400s, war brings development of weapons and armies. At this time, trade was number one with Asia. Between 1450 and 1470, we see the European Commercial Revolution. European trade changes in nature at this time. The quantity demanded increases as population increases. The standards of living increase and traders look for new markets. During this time, we see the rise of the merchant, which is the development of insurance, the development of banking, and the development of the credit system. The Euro-Asia trade is basically Asia wants weapons and Europe wants spices and silks. Pepper is the most important. Now salt at this time was used to preserve the meats because they did not have adequate refrigeration technology and pepper was used to mask the taste of meat. Meat wasn't always the freshest and pepper masked the taste. Now in 1450 latitude is discovered and this is important for navigation for ships they can venture a little further away from shore. Longitude was discovered in 1750. The way I remember this, latitude was discovered first and long after longitude was discovered. And this is very important for navigation. Ships can venture a little further out. Now during this time we also had changes in ship design. We went from clinker to carvel, hulls, wood to cotton sails, and single to triple mast. This was important because it reduced the friction of distance and with the, the navigation technology, ships ventured further away from shore and the routes became more direct and quicker. Now between 
1500 and 1800 doesn't mean that I'm jumping all the way to 1800, but between this time we see colonialism. And colonialism is very strongly rooted in mercantilism. And we're going to talk about mercantilism now. So under mercantilism, I have six headings. These are my own personal headings. It's bullionism, self-sufficiency, agriculture, control, colony, and France. So under bullionism, it is the economic health is measured by precious metals. It's a theory that economic health is measured by precious metals. And basically hard money means prosperity. Bullionism basically was the rise of the money economy out of the barter economy. And most money came from the Americas. Now self-sufficiency. Founding own industry should be rewarded as a nation and agriculture should be encouraged. As long as you're self-sufficient, you do not rely on another nation to supply you with food, which is very important. Control. Control is the need for sea power to control, which gives the rise of the merchant fleets. If you own a f your own fleet, it means independence, yet again, not relying on another nation. And the larger your fleet is, the more prestigious it is. Colony. Canada was a hinterland. Hinterland is basically um, Hamilton is a hinterland to Hamilton, or Hamilton is a hinterland to Toronto, and Hamilton is also a hinterland to New York. It's the economic reach. Now, for Canada to be a successful hinterland, we needed a large population, and we needed labor markets. Um, around this time, as a side note, luxury goods were believed to draw money out of the economy, and whereas mercantilism was strongly based on the belief of keeping as much money in your own economy, so exports were high, but imports should be kept very low. Now France, in terms of colonialism and mercantilism, um, Colbert liked economic regulation and Colbert bans the export of money, so he's a, a hardcore mercantilist. Um, around this time, the French merchant marine was around 300 ships, and families of three or more kids did not pay taxes, so that was a big incentive to have a big family because you didn't have to pay taxes. Great! So now, jumping back a little bit, um, 1493, um, Columbus discovers the Aztecs. 1497, Cabot discovers Newfoundland, and we'll talk what this what this means, Cabot discovering Newfoundland. So when Cabot discovers Newfoundland, it means cod, right? And this is our first staple that we see, right? Fish. So with cod came offshore fishing. Um, with offshore fishing, this means it was all done on the boat. When it was done all on the boat, it means the green curing process was done on the boat. The green curing process relied heavily on salt. salt to, the fish had to be salted every three days. And with all the fishing being done on the boat, it meant no onshore fishing, which meant no development. Now, there were two fisheries. There was the offshore bank fishery and the inshore fishery. When fishing became inshore, this meant the dry cure process. The dry cure process was less salt intensive, but you needed lumber and flakes. Um, the, needing, the need for lumber led to colonization of the Avalon Peninsula because um, when you needed, when there was a demand for the flakes and for the lumber, there was exploration in land. Now with the dry cure process, the main idea of the dry cure process was it had a better taste it had a lower cost. Um, you could charge a higher price because it was better and therefore profits increased. So the inland fishing led to development and inland fishing led to exploration. So now we're going to jump to the 1500s with the early European expansion. In 1501, um, Africa, the Europeans expanded into Africa, in the 1500s, Spain funds Columbus 
uh, Columbus's trek to the Aztecs. And Columbus finds Aztec gold and silver, which he brings back, and this causes inflation. Spain's success motivates England and France to explore as well. With all the gold that's being found, this funds war. And this means that there is a power shift to France, England, and to the Netherlands. Now remember we talked about uh, the exploration inland of the Avalon Peninsula by, by Cabot and the, the fishermen. What they found was fur, right? They found beaver, and beaver was the next major staple. So the English are using beavers at this time as the, inter or the beaver's intercoat to make felt hats. Around the 1500s, fashion changed in, in Europe, and they wanted wider brims on the hats. Therefore, the demand increased for beaver hats as supply decreased when the Russian beaver was over-harvested and supply decreased. The price increased, which was perfect at the time for North America and the development of the hinterland. The next 250 years, European expansion was because of a fur. The French were useless at trapping and they needed the natives, so we'll see how important this is with, uh, with Champlain, I believe, and the Iroquois. In 1535, Cartier sails the St. Lawrence. Now don't get Cartier and Cabot and Champlain all confused, so Cartier sails the St. Lawrence. Um, he visited the Aboriginal settlements Staticoma and Hachalega. Staticoma is now known as Quebec City and Hachalega is Montreal. The French fishermen make native contact, which leads to the French bringing fur back to France. Jumping ahead to the 1600s, fisheries begin to develop. Britain is motivated to be the first on site to become site captains. In September, the ships went back to Britain with their catches. Uh, Britain is a central man, uh, metropolis for, for, uh, for Newfoundland, and Newfoundland at the time is a hinterland. Britain is mainly trading fish at this time with Spain and France. Now, the features of cod fishing. There are two features. Cod fishing is high cost and high risk. It is high cost because the boats are a fixed cost and labor and provisions, well, they're kind of variable, but it is high risk because of storms, pirates, wars, marine insurance is expensive and very rare at the time, loans are high risk and high interest, 25 to 40 percent, makes our 17 percent visa card look not so bad. Now, the other problem is it is high risk because they're accounting on a big catch, and the big catch may not happen. So this leads to market price variability. Now, we will talk about the merchant sack ships being sent up to buy the surplus cod to bring back to England, but that comes a little later. But th that's when it started. In the 1600s, the merchant sack ships were being sent to buy up the surplus cod to bring back to England a little bit sooner than when the ships were coming back.